Hobbit Racing here. We have part two. We got so far ahead of ourselves, so many different things going on. This lovely racer sideways McLaren 720S. How could we not bring you part two of the tune? I left off when I was messing around with glue in that big beautiful wing right there on the back of the car. So let's get back into what I was doing with this beautiful, beautiful slot car. Results are absolutely wonderful for a GT car. I had a little bit of trials and tribulations along the way, but what fun would it be if I could just set it out there on the track and instantly go after some records or at least be competitive in my lap time. So let's see how I actually arrived at a fully tuned McLaren 720S by Racer Sideways. We've got our guide out here now. We've got our SP, we've got our slotting plus guide, our SP101001. And uh, it's just simply a lot different in terms of the depth. And that's what matters to me. You've got about 10 millimeters of depth. So we're going to come in here and we're going to want a little bit of relief to get our guide a little bit lower than the, than the front wheels. I've been doing this so long. I have a pretty good understanding if I have a thicker GT car or an LMP car, as opposed to maybe, oh, a very older GT car that I could put maybe or a group five car or a thunder slot Can-Am car that I could put uh, 5201 zero grips that have a much, much um, less ride height to them. Uh, then I might end up putting a 0.2 spacer to get some relief. Um, or only need a 0.1 spacer, pardon me, for relief. Uh, so I might need a 0.1 spacer. Well, it appears that we had some technical difficulties. So I'm going to narrate this part for you and let you know that, uh, you know, I'm putting that 0.01 spacer on there and I'm trying to get an understanding of whether or not that's going to get me or start to get this car into the relief, right? Into the gain where the braid gain is and that we can get low enough. Um, uh, I'm showing you there, obviously, that like most slot cars, there's a relief of the gooseneck that goes up inside of there. But suddenly I discovered that I don't like something about the way this front axle's rolling. So I um, gave it a little bit of testing here. You know, what you can't hear, you can't hear anything scraping inside of there. Uh, but uh, I started to get the understanding that maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe something's up. But uh, I wanted to try and knock out the guide at this point in time. So, you know, I let it go. The front wheels were spinning because I needed to lower this car. You know, the goal is either I wanted to smack. <laughs> either I wanted to give the car a big fat smack right there. Of course not. I'm trying to make sure that the car is resting well and that the guide is going to be low enough in the slot when it's in the braid when it's touching the braid on the track. So I'm going to get rid of that 0.01 and I'm going to change it out to a 0.02 spacer and we're going to take care of that part first. But I've gotten frustrated to the point where I've now realized the plastic soldering underneath that is holding the weight reduced interior has become a problem and you know, no matter where that ride height is now, even if I wanted to get the ride height lower, meaning I'm going to move the front axle further up underneath the body and raising it higher on the chassis, clearly those plastic soldering spots are interfering. And so, um, you know, I'm going to play around with that for a moment and see as I get this body post screw back in here what that is going to mean for me in terms of whether or not I've made a difference. And in the long run, I absolutely made a difference as far as the uh, necessary, you know, Dremel work. Now, you know, there are some, you know, there are some race directors, what have you, that might tell you, oh, you're not allowed to modify the interior of the body or you're not allowed to modify certain parts of the car. At the end of the day, we're all trying to have fun. But if we're going to race and we're going to be in competition, you've got to be able to have your front wheel spin. And here's something else to note. As I went to work on more setup, I was discovering that the chassis might be a little bit out of form. 
not so much that I can't deal with it, but perhaps a little bit out of form. And what you can tell is because if you take, you know, just any tool and you push down from one side and you don't have, or even your finger, and you don't have any play, and then you take the other side and you hear that play, the front tires were not resting evenly the same way as they were on the other side. So I have come to settle that as best I can. I probably should show that best by at least putting the, um, putting the rear axle back on because four tires in a rolling setup are what is going to make more of the difference in this environment. So um, again, we have a solid contact on this wheel, but then on this side, we had what was the equivalence of the axle only moving up to catch the bottom of this set screw right here when I pushed on it. And you could visibly see the plastic actually sinking. But now we have a nice rolling setup. But in the discovery of that, something else that I found, which will be need to be dealt with pretty much immediately is this bushing is seated very well in the plastic. Well, I don't know about very well. It's seated well enough that it's not moving. But if I can get this bushing here in a bright enough seat, what I can show you is, hopefully, if I can get that into the light in the right way, that bushing is rotating completely within its housing. We do not want that to be the case so that's 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 not good uh, again things happen um it's a it's it's a it's a well-engineered slot car but performance wise you want this axle to be spinning freely and engaged in one singular point between the spur gear and the pinion and then you want everything else locked into place so it's simple we just take this right here and this is where we drop our ca glue in key factor key factor as far as how that goes you want your chassis set up in a rolling environment whether gear lash engaged or not and you must have this axle in here because if there's enough play if there's enough play in here for this to rotate then you need to have your axle in a position where it's exactly where you want it in a rolling setup whether you want it engaged or not, I don't think that's going to make as much of a difference right now. But what you want is to make sure that you're fairly level where you want it and glue while the axle is in place. If you glue without the axle in place, well, then if that bushing is off, then your axle could be tilted or worse. One side could be straight and the other side could be crooked and you will create even bigger friction points. And you do not want to be taking, for the most part, you do not want to be taking round files and file out bushings. If the bushing's bad, get a new bushing. These bushings seems really nice, it's just rotating, so we need to get rid of that. So as you can hear, our MX-16 breaking in in the background. A little drop of CRC226. Again, that's to break it in. We're not doing things to enhance the motor and quote unquote juice the motor. Yes, that's liquid, uh, but we're not juicing the motor. We're not doing things to enhance the performance of it. We are just breaking it in with essentially uh, lubrication. So at this point in time, as we're breaking that in and we're going to transition ourselves to using the um, short can motor, we need to bring ourselves up to speed with the CG MA01A. This is a uh, this is a short can situation that we're taking advantage of from a long can angle winder pod. These are wonderful. We'll just show you Got a nice uh, screw there that we could use if we need to. But we folks want to have perhaps the um, the pinion and the shaft less uh, 
less sticking less out on the front side here where they're engaging uh, with it. So I could try that and I certainly could put this on here uh, in a way where this rips on and this, as you can see, acts more like the tabs that you would find on a long can motor. I find a long can motor. Here's a slot. Here's a flat six. This actually allows you to see the difference or the comparison of what would be the same look because of the fact that you have a motor pod that might be holding on to spaces for that. So I can try that. I personally, I personally like to stack them, uh, but I guess I can try and see. And the other, the other to me, the other disadvantage of doing it this way, the disadvantage of doing it this way is I have to put the pinion on after I attach this to the front side. So not, not my ideal way to do it, but again, we'll see that come to fruition as we're done breaking in this MX-16. Okay, so now we have our guide in place. We have the SP-101001 in place with the screw that came with it. The gooseneck on the sideways is a little bit bigger than I would have hoped. And there's still a little bit of front to back, but there's virtually no side to side. Got a drop of oil in there. And uh, it's a snug fit, as we would expect. And really, uh, you know, it's, again, necessary for me with the deeper, the deep wood track. Take advantage of it. Why not? And then you'll also notice that I did actually choose to mount the CG adapter as proposed without removing the excess blocking to hold on to the backside of the motor mount that basically makes it a long can. It's not entirely snug as you can see, uh, but it is, but it is, um, it's not entirely snug against the bell end of the motor, uh, but it is snug in there. And then I've used one screw this screw right here is virtually impossible to get through. The head of the screw would never make it past the bushing housing. So, um, but this is good. This was nice and it actually came with several extra, came with a lock washer and a washer uh, so that it wasn't gonna get too deep inside the motor. So another nice feature uh, to have that included from, um, from CG. And again, just to highlight that again, CG slot cars uh, so if anyone's looking for this, it's a wonderful part. They do several 3D printed parts made in the USA. Uh, so again, uh, that's a CGMA01A, CG motor adapter. I've also glued both of those bushings in as I recommended that anytime you have any kind of play, we only want two things moving, the axle and the gear. And that's it. And so we have got ourselves in quite a good position right now doing the logical routine things. All of this is going to make up the difference, tenths, thousands in terms of lap times. So we're going to back build. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go one step further. In my experience with the 23,000 RPM motor that I'm not entirely thrilled about out of the box in terms of the tack, but it's a new motor. I'm going to go with it for the time being. I'm coming in around 22,000 RPMs at 12 volts, but I'm going to go with um, 11, 29. I could go 12, 32. I could go 10, 27. I could go 11, 28. 11, 28 is pushing it out of the box. It's a nice gear. I will definitely uh, save this for uh, a rainy day. <laughs> How about another slot car? I'll save this for another slot car. I believe this is the only sideways gear you can get for their angle winder cars uh, that come out of the box that way, except for the group fives that were uh, built exclusively, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I don't have it out of the box with the slot at parts, but uh, that would come with a yellow 28 tooth. But this is a sideways part. So um, that being said, I'll save it. Uh, but we're going to go 29. 1129 is 26, 2.64. I run a lot of cars on this track with a 23,000 RPM motor around 2.67, 266, I often say. You'll hear in my videos. 267 if you round up. Uh, sometimes 276. Uh, you know, but basically, once you start getting down below the 2.6s, you really need more torque out of the motor. This has about 170 grams of torque, I think, which is why it's not terrible if you have the Baby King motors, say, in a Group 5 car or in an NSR GT car, 
and you have that 17,000 RPM motor, but the 245 grams of torque produces some of the fastest times. Now you could do the same thing, but this particular class that was developed again by Scott Culp, this is how it was determined for GT high performance, was to run an MX-16, and that's fine, so that your, your choice of movement is, once you pick the spec motor, figure out what gets you the takeoff power for how you're configuring the car, how much weight you're putting into the car, the shape of the car, the arrow of the car, and figuring all that out. So to me, 2.64 is closer to where I want to be rather than going down a tooth that was the stock. Moving rapidly along, we've now got our braid in and our eyelets. I actually like the eyelets that came with this car. They're wider, they really stay secure in here. So we've got all the point where we're now getting ready to re-engage the rear and then we'll go ahead and get it a little bit warmed up under load before we bring it out to the track. I like to always break my motors in without load and then break them in with load and I'll do that on the rolling road. Um, and then we, we'll figure out the float. We'll figure out, you know, do we want to put five, total of five screws here or something? Probably even do that before I even do anything else. I don't think we're going to leave that rear end just capable of popping up out of the chassis. But what we need to do now is we need to align the rear of the car here to make sure we're not gonna have our tire come up against our gear. We've gotta get our gear lash appropriate. And if we can, so much as creating any less friction points, can we get an axle spacer in between the gear and the bushing? I'm gonna try. It's gonna be tight. As you can see here, I don't even have the pinion very far on the motor shaft otherwise i would lose the engagement where it was and i think i can bring the tire out a little bit wider so we can always put the puller back on there and try and pull it back a little bit but let's start let's try let's see what we can do and let's grab a 0.05 require us to be a little bit a little bit cheeky here because Again, you don't want to ever jam this plastic past the brass. So when we're doing this, we're going to keep that axle spacer on there and the pinion at the same time. And I always like to come in at an extreme angle and just bring it all together all at the same time. Well, I'm not liking that lash. This is a little trick that you can do just to make sure you've got good axle movement in the, in the bushings while you're trying to get that lash in place. I just didn't like the way that that, yeah, see, I just didn't like the way that that went in there. I don't know why. It shouldn't be creating an additional friction point. We don't have anything. Oops, we haven't taken away the, um, as I just dropped the axle spacer, we haven't taken away anything that should change, you know, this. There's nothing going on here that should stop that from spinning freely. The gear lash that is created here shouldn't change, except that can obviously bring that further away. So the only thing we could do is put the pinion perhaps, perhaps a little further on there. I'm not entirely sure. Wow, I'm getting purple on my hands. Interesting gear, you're giving up your purple plastic, so it seems. I don't know, that must be something else. Um, so yeah, I'm not entirely thrilled about that. And I'm not entirely thrilled that I dropped a .05 axle spacer. Those could be precious, but the good news is I haven't lost it. I've just misplaced it. Back in business right there on the setup block. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna just put this back in the way that it was, knowing that I had good gear lash. Gear lash is gonna mean far more to us than creating that one less friction point with the axle spacer. Again, everybody's plastic design is just slightly different than everybody else's, right? If I wanted to get to a slotted pod, then so be it. Um, we really almost have the perfect bit of play automatically created, which is very typical, very typical in an angle winder setup, right? You're, you're almost always gonna get that little bit of thousandth of play 
because the angle winder locks you in pretty much automatically. Uh, but I would have preferred to be able to put an axle spacer in there. I just don't see it happening. So that's not in the plans. It's not part of our plans for this car, and that's okay. I don't expect it to be a situation where it creates a world of problems for us. We're going to go ahead and we're going to lock this spur gear here because there's really nothing we can do about that otherwise finding our place where the tire rests. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's set this in. Let's line this up right against the body post. Figure out just how much further we can move our tire patch out to the wide side. Whoops. I'm going to say that's about right there. I'm going to say that's where it's going to be. That's pretty close. We have just a fraction to play. <sighs> I'm wondering if that gear is not round and that's why I wasn't using it. Almost no play there, a lot of play there. Hmm. Then we reach a point of almost no play. That could be the bushing. It could be the gear. We'll have to see what break-in tells us. Let's get some oil inside of there. Let's get some oil right there. And in turn, let's do the same thing on this other side. And in this case, we still are absolutely going to use our axle spacer on this side against the stop collar. Anytime that I can just create less friction from a larger part to a smaller part, we're going to do it. In this case, I don't want to say there's no point to figuring out if the axle stop needs to go right up against it, but I don't really see that there's a way that it can't. Now that's an awful lot of movement there on that side, but then there's almost no movement when we make another half a turn. So I might replace that gear anyway, but I'm going to have to go at it with the largest point of play and then lock it in here. And that might even require me to not align my, it might even require me to not align my screws. I don't like doing that, but in this particular instance, I've got to pay attention to what hand I'm being dealt at this point in time. And there's that part that I mentioned where it's halfway around. So I'm probably going to replace that gear at some point. It does not look when I hold it up against a background. Yeah, I can feel it's free there and then it gets tighter and then it's free and then it's tighter. So that's not going to be my favorite thing. So I will most likely look to change that out. And so what I think I'll probably do, because the stop collar isn't going to go anywhere, I'm going to align my gear and my tire. For now, I'm just going to put this on here just snug so I can still move it. And let's take a look. I think I've gone just a fraction too far on that side. So let's push it on a little further. And that's going to be it, folks. That is our initial tune right there. We haven't knocked the edges off of any of the tires. Of any of the tires? We haven't knocked the edges off of the rear tires yet, the CB58s. The one deficiency that I'm feeling is the way that this gear lash is not entirely round up against the leading edge of the gear. But we have a nice, compliant setup for... Hobbit Racing Park GT High Performance. We have a much improved guide in here compared to what was out of the box. Even though I appreciate the sideways attempt at a screw-in guide, it is not a deep wood guide, so it is going to be much more compliant for what we need. I'm going to throw a couple of screws in the back here, and we will see how the five-point pod works for me. And other than that, we won't coat the tires just yet, and we will finally 
get a look at this car with the beautiful body sitting on top of it and we'll break in that motor under load for a few minutes and then we'll get it out on the track. Well, we're up to about eight volts. Um, it's a little bit rattly. I have to tell the truth, it's a little bit rattly. I wish it was a little smoother running on that rolling road. Uh, it seems powerful at the ratio that I chose, but it's a little rattly. We'll have to figure out what that's all about, but we're gonna ramp up and get on the track. Well, this is a tune where we just went for it, right? We just went for it. We didn't put this car out on the track to see what the baby Raptor could do. We took it apart. We figured out what was good, what wasn't so good. I wouldn't use the word maybe not so good, but where things were from a baseline standpoint. And we went from there to make the car class compliant. Man, that's just, that's a beautiful car. Anything that is green and red and white with that Castrol symbol on it and is a McLaren in this case, just, it's my first McLaren. So let's find our way halfway. Eight and eight, eight on the sensitivity and eight on the braking. And let's see what this does for us. We have the slotting plus guide. We have CB58 Fs, quick slicks on the back here. We have widened our stance ever so slightly in the front. We have no float on the motor pod, no float on the body. And we have our MX-16, which is class compliant for GT high performance, which could make up anything from a slot it to a fly, to a scale auto, to a sideways GT2, GT3 car uh, that can be played around with on the gear ratio. And the gear ratio we're at right now is 11.29. So let's go. First laps out of the gate. Yeah. It doesn't sound overly great. I can tell it doesn't sound great. It sounds almost as plasticky as one of the Ninkos that I did recently, but that car ended up being a screaming, screaming car. This is a little bit different. Um, this even feels like it might be getting bound up. This could be that 29 tooth gear that I mentioned that seems slightly wobbly where the friction point is. I'm not sure. I'm not pushing anything just yet. Well, it's pretty, it's pretty, no doubt, but um, I'm gonna run a few more laps, clean the tires real quick. Um, again, we don't have any kind of float um, anywhere, which is fine, uh, but I'm not necessarily thrilled with what I'm just hearing out of the gate as far as how the car travels. And if you do this often enough, whether you're looking at comparing cars or whether you're looking to maybe see if a sideways GT car is for you, I'm sure that I'll be able to dial this in. Um, and I can definitely tell a difference as I turn the tires, as I turn the rear axle, there's a point where it's freer. And then there's a point where it's not as free as I'd like it to be. So we may go back to that 28 tooth gear and see what we can do with a 254. 254 is a pretty extreme end when it comes to um, a 23,000 RPM motor that has a little bit less torque to take off. They can all hit the high end, right? There's no question. We can all eventually, we can eventually, uh, you know, all of our variables disappear on a straightaway where we can all pull the trigger full throttle. But it's about how you accelerate out of the corners and maybe how you're taking off from a dead stop that make up the difference combined with driver skill. Well, I'll put it down there a few more times. There's nothing, nothing obstructive on the front. We've got great spinning on the front. We've got 
a decent bit of relief on the front. We don't appear to be hanging up on anything on the track. So there's nothing plastic that's creating any friction there. But I can feel that friction point every, every time that it goes through a full rotation. I can feel a little bit of extra on my finger when I push it forward. So it could be as simple as having to disassemble, deal with the gears we have. I need to order parts. I need some angle winder parts anyway. Maybe I'll get a pack of, take me from 27 to 30 and be able to do that. But I'll run it a few more times and because it's a little bit higher gear, maybe I'll turn the brake down a little bit and see if I can pull out some of that extra braking that's coming out of it. Yeah, we might we might mess with it the way that it is. We'll see. Uh, but overall, just I mean, I could look at that car all day long. I'm going to figure out um, maybe what race this was a livery from. Uh, the fact that it has the black pane, blanc pane, French, I'm sure. Uh, as far as that goes, I'm sure that means that it was probably a liveried car. Uh, or even if it was a livery that was only for, you know, prologue ahead of a race weekend uh they did give us some extra stickers and i can try and see if i can find this at the real scale one to one i didn't think i i tried and i couldn't at the time uh when i received this as a present so uh but those extra stickers and believe me i'm happy to use them at their water slide and that'll be fun as well to put on there so let's get the screwdriver let's see if we can't loosen things up a little bit let's get some body float out of this and um Maybe a little pod float and uh, see if we can't at least just turn some times that are realistic for this class of car. Well, we've got an ever so slight amount of body float. I try to avoid too much body float because you just start to rattle things around. But uh, let's see what we've got going on here. And of course, we're not really looking from an overall performance standpoint. It's about the feel. You know, what can we feel from the car? We have no weight in the car and it's definitely gonna need some weight. Let's um, let's peel back the layers of the onion and dial in a bit of pod float. Back about three quarters of a turn here, just to try and see. And of course, the other thing is, is that Sideways has this chassis that inherently has some flex in the middle of it. There we go, now I can see some. Now I can see some physical movement of that pod. Spread our braid out just a marginal amount there and see what we can't do. See what we can't do. Come on, sideways. Nope, I'm on the verge of hitting five vibes, maybe. But not because of anything great so far about the performance of the car. But that's okay. We don't give up after one shot. And just because I've tuned plenty of car out of the gate that came out successful, it's actually a good thing to not have every single time that you pick the gear ratio and you do a few things to the car, that it comes out perfect because you've got lessons to learn when you're tuning cars. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the brake down just a little bit more or maybe back up a little bit more because I do see the rear of this car swinging out wide and go back to eight and eight, but I don't see anything. Certainly super noisy, certainly super noisy and some things to be done. So let's stop there and we'll go back to the 
race director station and see what we can't work on. All uh, right, we are we are back in business with the sideways 720s, the McLaren 720s, um, and we are we're back we're back with the original gear that came with the car, the orange 28 tooth gear, and uh, much 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 improved gear lash. And to my surprise, with the um, lower gear ratio and the higher gearing, we're taking off quite nicely. I've even dialed this in and we've got some weight in here now too. I should say that there's definitely weight inside of this car. So um, yeah, we're really, we're really in a good spot with it now. This is a really good way to kind of summarize where we went. Again, we went back to the 28 tooth gear and we've got a little bit of weight in the front of the motor pod. She's not the quietest of cars, but she boogies. Well, I am running five threes, five low five fours, five threes. So, you know, that's, that's right where you want to be. It's right where you want to be for GT high performance. That means if we step over one more lane, we can run in the low five twos, maybe the five teens if we really turn a hot laps. So, you know, at the end of the day, just a wonderful car, a wonderfully great performing car that sits there at the high end of the GT high performance class. And really ultimately, um, at the end of the day, for me, you combine that with the fact that it's a Castro livery. Yep, gets a thumbs up every time for me. That now concludes this set of videos where we unboxed this wonderful car. Hey, it says Castro on it. That excites me already, right? And then we took ourselves through some initial tuning components where we started to really work on the car. And then now we have seen even working our way through some imperfections. Hey, everybody, it's plastic. Sometimes you got to manipulate and massage the things that you're given to get to the end result. But ultimately, so thrilled with the end result. I love all my slot cars, but I sure love it when they come out fast when I'm done with them. So thanks for watching. Don't forget, give me some comments for feedback. I'm happy to interact with all of you out there. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It really helps out the channel. Thanks for watching. If you don't subscribe to Cobra Racing, I'll poke you with my staff. Pokey, pokey, pokey. She will poke you with her staff. Pokey!